and how the, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And as long as I've been in churches, I've noticed that they're, they're comprised of just working people. I don't remember any geniuses that being in any of the churches that I've ever been in. But they're just ordinary people, and I believe it's always been that way. Just ordinary people that are faithful people. And I remember Mother telling me years ago that way back when Sand Springs was young, there was a, a few women here in Sand Springs started having a prayer meeting in the home, a little Bible study in the home. And they weren't geniuses. They weren't even preachers. They were just some godly women that got together and they'd study the Bible and it began to grow and began to grow. And fi fi finally, that became Broadway Baptist Church. And I know sometimes we get discouraged and we think, well, I don't really have any talents. I don't, I'm not great, I'm not rich, I'm not brilliant, I'm not anything. But you see, you can be faithful. And you think back over the centuries, the church has always gone forward. Not by the mighty, not by the noble, but just by the faithful. Just simple people going to work every day, being faithful to the Lord in the little things. And the gospel has gone on because of it. I'm, I'm thankful for the faithful ones. Something happened several years ago, and I think I shared this with you. I don't know whether I did or not because I'm getting so absent. My, I get where I can't remember what. I don't even remember whether I told you this story or not. I probably told you this story, and if I did, well, I laugh anyway, all right? <laughs> some people, some men went on church visitation, and they come to this house and the lights were on, the TV was on, and they knocked on the door and they knocked on the door and they knocked on the door and nobody came to the door. They went back two nights later and they knocked on the door and this man answered the door and they visited with him a little bit and they said, well, we were here two nights ago and the lights were on and the TV was on and we knocked and knocked and knocked and nobody answered the door. And he said, well, that night that you came was when our t favorite television program's on. I said, we don't answer the phone. We don't answer the door. We, when that program's on, we don't do anything but watch that program. And one of the visitors said, that must be a good program. What is it? And he thought a little bit. He said, uh, he said now what's that flower? He said, it's, it's, it's a, a big, pretty red flower, and it grows on a bush, and the bush has thorns. He said, rose? He said, yeah. He said, Rose, what's the name of that TV program? <laughs> well, I'm getting almost as bad. You know, I'll tell these stories, and then I think, did I tell them that story? But something happened several years ago that I'd never thought of before. We was way off down at Texas. I don't remember exactly where it was, but we got lost in the town. We was trying to find a highway out of town, and we knew the number of the highway, but we couldn't find it. And there was a yard sale there. And... Uh, I just thought, well, I'll stop and ask these ladies how to get on this certain highway to get back to Oklahoma. And as I walked up to one of them, I said, I said, excuse me, but I'm lost. I said, I'm trying to get to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I don't know how to get out of town. I'm looking for this highway, certain highway. She was so sweet. She said, why, you're not very lost. She said, you just go down here at the corner, and you go two blocks, and there's the highway. But she was so sweet, you, could, you knew she was a Christian. She, you just the spirit, her spirit. I went back and got in the car and I thought, there's so many Christians living today that are so sweet that we don't know in other towns, perhaps in other countries, that if we could fellowship with them, we'd just dearly love them. You know, that they'd be so welcome here. They'd just fit right in because they have such love, you know. And then I had to think, but think about all the Christians down through the centuries that we've never had an opportunity to meet. There's Christians right there in Sepulpa or maybe Sky too, that are real sweet people that we've never had an opportunity to meet. But someday we'll have a chance to meet all those people. And the gospel goes forward because of those type of people that are just spirit-filled and they're faithful. So I really appreciate that song and that's a, that's a really a good song. I'm trying to educate Ted, 
You know, a lot of times people will t tell you things or teach you things that really don't do you much good. You know what I'm saying? A lot Schools are a lot that way. You know, they, they'll teach a lot of things that you never use later on in life. But I try to teach people things that will really be beneficial to them. So one thing I taught him while I go out, when I come up there, I said, Ted, let me teach you something. Never say anything about a man that's going to speak after you do. I said, <laughs> Because he who laughs last, laughs best. And I'm sure he will always remember that after tonight. No, I'm not really going to give Ted a bad time. Uh, but we're never going to have a lock-in here at this church if Ted comes. Because we'd have to meet with the finance committee to replace all the windows. Because that man can snore. And I told Patty, I said, Patty, you're going to have special stars in your crown or go deep. <laughs> One of the two. But I, it, I did. I kind of goofed up. I, I told a bunch of the people at church, I said, hey, we're going to Hardy's right after church. We're going to Hardy's right after church. Well, I remember telling Sue, Ralph and Sue, I said, we're going to Hardy's after church. Won't you all meet us out there? And they said, all right. So after I told everybody that, then some of them said, well, we're tired of Hardy's. Why don't we go to Long John Silver's? And I said, fine with me. <laughs> well, I started out there, and just about the time we got to Long John Silver's, I told my wife, I said, hey, wait a minute. I said, I told Ralph and Sue that we was going to Hardy's. I said, we better go up there and see if they're at Hardy's. We drove up there, and I said, oh, Eureka, I don't see their car. Maybe they went on home, and they didn't, you know. But they were there. There's Ralph sitting in there waving out the window, you know. So I had to I let Susie out. I said, well, I'll let you out, and you go tell them I'll be back in a minute. So I'll run back down along John Silver. Told Jason, I said, Jason, we got to eat up here at Hardy's because Ralph and Sue's up there. And Well, Ralph, uh, I mean, Ted had gone home. He comes back to Long John Silver's. I'm not there. I was thoroughly disappointed because by the time I got to Hardy's, Ralph was already through eating, and Sue, I mean, they waited on us. We appreciate that. And she had like two bites left, so I thought, well, just well stated, Long John's. But anyway, that's, uh, that's as close to apology you're going to get out of me. <laughs> and, uh, and I want you to know that any of you, on Sunday morning after church, you're all invited to Hardy's. Now, we might wind up somewhere else, but you all are invited to Hardy's. We don't know what we're going to do, but that was just a, that was an error on my part when I told everybody, okay, we'll go to Long John Silver's because I forgot that I told Ralph and Sue. And they were sitting there so lonesome and just getting ready to leave and wiping the crumbs off their mouth when we came in, so I don't think they'd have missed us anyway. Turn, if you will, to Acts. Yeah, I'm not going to say more about Ted's snoring because that's just something you'd have to see to believe. I'm not, I'm serious. <laughs> I am not serious. I mean, I, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I've never heard anything like that. I've, I have learned You've learned your lesson, didn't you? <laughs> You'll never say any more before when you know I'm going to get up and speak. Well, as long as you've... Learned your lesson. All right, now we're in chapter 15 of Acts. And I'm really glad that uh, uh, Rose is here. <laughs> no, I couldn't. Well, the reason I said that, I couldn't think of his name. Rex. Rex, we're really glad that you're here tonight. We can tell he's a Baptist. He sits right on the back. You know, that's the way Baptists do. They come in and they all fight for the back pew. I don't know why that is, but they all fight. Now, Mr. Tanner and his wife, Pat, Huh? Oh, Tanton. Tanton. Not that I'll remember, but anyway. Uh, so the rest of the church will know. Tanton. I'm not really sure what they are because they sit about three rows up, four rows up, say, but they're more than half Baptist, I can tell you that. Now, if they get, I don't know what Ted is. He sits up here close to the front. But we're glad to see Rex. We're always glad to see Rex when it comes. Glad to see all of you. Glad to see all of you. We're, we're studying the 15th chapter of Acts, and if you remember, the, uh, they had a dispute. 
And the dispute was, do the Gentiles that are saved, do they need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses? So there at the Jerusalem church, the mother church, the apostles and the leaders of that church, James, the brother of Jesus, who was the pastor of the church, they had a council. And so they had the apostles speak and they had various ones speak. And so they come to the conclusion at this council, of course they were certainly led of the Holy Spirit, that we're under grace and not under law. And we find that the apostle Paul and Barnabas, who had just returned from their missionary trip, had got up and gave them a lot of examples of how that God was saving the Gentiles and what a great and drastic change had occurred in their lives, how they had given up idolatry and how that uh, they were so ungodly and now they were godly. And so they were showing by that that were saved by grace. And these Gentiles had never been circumcised. They knew nothing about the law of Moses. And so they were saved by grace. Now, one of the reasons they came up is because there were some Christian Pharisees. Now, these were Pharisees that were, uh, were Israelites, but they'd been converted. And they were honest in their belief, and they really believed, and they were teaching that, yes, but these Gentiles must be circumcised. Now, the reason they believed that is because the Bible declares that the, through the Jews, the Gentiles will be blessed. And so they thought, well, then they need to become like a Jew. They need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. James, who was indeed a legalist, he was a legalist, but the Holy Spirit evidently revealed to him that we are saved by grace. And so he, he quoted a scripture there and he brought out to them, yes, to the Pharisees, yes, brethren, you're right, the Gentiles will be blessed through the Jews. But this will be another time. This will be after Jesus comes back. And then Jesus will establish the kingdom and he will set up the throne and sit on the throne of David. And that's when the, uh, all of the weapons will be turned into plowshares and then all of the Gentiles will be evangelized because of the efforts of the Jews. But he said right now, God is doing something different. He's calling out a bride, a Gentile bride. He's calling out a people for his namesake. So the matter was settled. So now, verse 28. Well, let, we better back up just a little bit. Let's start at verse 19. Wherefore my sins is... Now, this was the conclusion. This is James speaking. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath of the day. So he says, this is the only conditions that we will put on the Gentiles, that they abstain from forn fornication. Now, why that? Why just pick that one out? Because we know that we're to be holy, and we know that we're to flee all sin. It's not just fornication, but it's all ungodliness. Well, he picked out one in particular because fornication was so widespread among the Gentiles, it was even incorporated into their idol worship. And like in the temple of Diana and some of those uh, pagan temples, uh, the priestesses that would minister there in the temples, they were prostitutes. And it was so widespread and the Gentiles saw nothing wrong with fornication. In other words, it was such a stumbling block. He said, so we write to them that they abstain from fornication, from things offered to idols, from blood and from things strangled. Now, the reason they would abstain from animals that had been strangled because the carcass would contain the blood, and so they would have to be eating the blood. And then he goes on to say, because that's read of Moses every Sabbath. Well, what is he talking about here? What's the deal about the blood? We know the life is in the blood, but does that mean then that Gentiles are under law, that we can't eat blood? Well, I don't, can't imagine anybody that would want to. Okay, but here's what he's really saying, and please keep in mind, don't be a stumbling block. 
He said, there, in other words, he's saying to the Gentiles that are being saved, if they eat blood, if they eat animals strangled, that will be such a stumbling block to the Jews because Moses taught that continually not to drink blood, not to eat blood, and not to eat an animal that had been strangled. So if the Gentiles then was to doing that, you see what a rift that would put in the church. And so we're not to do anything, and even today, we're not to do anything that will cause problems in the church. You know, Paul said, it's all right for me to eat, eat meat. Notice it said things offered to idols. In another place, he said, an idol is nothing. An idol is nothing. He said, we know that. And he said, it's all right for me to eat meat, but I won't eat meat. In other words, I won't eat meat that's been offered to an idol. And, and that's a whole new lesson when it says meat offered to an idol. It doesn't mean you go in a temple and there it's been cooked and offered to an idol. It was meat that was sold in the marketplace, but, but nevertheless, sold in the shambles, they call it. But he said, I'll not eat meat as long as the world stands if it's going to offend my brother. So mainly what they're trying to do is what? Bring unity into the church. And they know that if the, if the, uh, if the Gentiles are drinking blood or eating animals that have been strangled, that will be such an offense to the Jews, it will be a stumbling block. So then in a little while, what you're going to have is a Gentile church and a Jewish church. And what was Jesus' prayer? That we all be one. You know, I know this, and you know this. There's so many denominations. There's all kinds of denominations. And, but I want to tell you right now, that's really not good, folks. Now, I can see the reason for it. I can see the purpose in it. But that's not good. Now, let me tell you why it isn't good. <clears throat> because this Bible says something in particular and specific. It doesn't say one thing to you and one thing to you. If it says one thing to you and one thing to you, somebody's not interpreting it right. Does that make sense? Now, the Bible says also in Ephesians that God gave to the church apostles, pastors, teachers, uh, so forth and so on, to be ministers and to teach and, and to continue to do this. What? Until it brings all the Christians into the unity. Brings us all together. Now, that sounds funny because we have Baptists above the door. Now, let me share something with you. The Baptists are evolving. Now, let me rephrase it. The Baptists are retrogressing. We're having a lot of problems in the convention and in the association. A lot of Baptists are denying the faith. A lot of them no longer believe in the virgin birth and the resurrection and the, and, and the fact that Jesus was uh, perfect. They don't believe that. But they still go under the banner of Baptist. And I don't think that's good. Now, you might ask me, Jerry, why are you a Baptist? Well, let me tell you why I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist because I believe that your old-time fundamental Baptists are still the closest to the true teaching of the Scripture that we have today. Now, does that mean that I agree with everything Baptists teach? No. Some of you know that. Some of the things I've taught, no doubt, have caused problems in the church because I don't take the stand on everything that Baptists as a whole accept. But I still believe that the Baptists are, are closer. Now, when I say Baptist, I'm talking, I'm talking about your Bible-believing, fundamental Baptist, that's what I'm talking about. I, I believe we're still closer than anything else or I'd be something else. Does that make sense? If I thought the Presbyterians were closer, I'd be over here at the Presbyterian church. If I thought the Catholics were closer, that's where I'd be. Now, I'm not condemning the rest of them. I'm not condemning the rest of them. But I'm just telling you why I'm a Baptist. But I'm still saying that isn't good. And I really believe this. I believe when the Lord comes back, in fact, I know this. Well, what's the problem today? Why are there different denominations? Well, you see, this may come a shock to you, but we're not all perfect yet. We don't all have perfect understanding. How many here believe that it's possible that our thinking is, is prejudiced? Is that a possibility? I mean, now, wait a minute. Even though 
You want to do what's right. And even though you study the scriptures, and even though you want to believe what God teaches, how many believe that it's still possible to be prejudiced? Well, of course it is. That's very possible. Now, is it possible for me to be prejudiced? Just because I was raised a Baptist? <laughs> no. <laughs> of course it is. And so we've got to keep in mind that in all of these churches, there are sincere, godly people that are studying the scriptures. They pray and ask God to lead them. But I'll tell you, prejudice is so strong. And so many times we look back and say, that's what my grandpa taught. That's what my great-grandpa taught. That's what my daddy taught and my mama taught. And it's hard to break loose from that. And that's what the Jews were having an awful hard time. Now, you stop thinking about this. Here we have the Jews who were under the Mosaic law for centuries. And please keep in mind, Judaism is not a religion. It was a whole way of life, the, all of their culture. Now, with us, uh, being a Baptist, it's our denomination. It, it's our... But, but yet, at the same time, I may not live any different than someone that goes to the Presbyterian church. Maybe they live next door to me. I still mow my grass. We wear the same kind of clothes. We eat the same kind of food. All of those things. Not with a Jew. Boy, they had their own culture, their own food, their own songs, everything. Now, all of a sudden, that's all over? All that Moses taught is out the door. Can you imagine how hard it was for a Jew when these men come preaching now we're saved by grace? No longer have to be circumcised. No longer have to keep the law of Moses. Man, how devastating to them. So at this council, they said, okay, re abstain from fornication, things strangled, and from blood, and things offered to idols. Why? Because they didn't want to ostracize the Jews. They didn't want, they didn't, it was hard enough for them the way it is. Don't be a stumbling block to them. So now here's what happened. Then pleased the, the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. That's verse 22, by the way. S namely, Judas, surnamed Bar Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicily. No, I'm sorry, Silica. Now, there's one thing else when you, you, you read the book of Acts is that there's no hierarchy in the church. Now, God gave to the church 12 apostles and I'm so thankful that he did. Folks, and there's 12 apostles, there'll never be any more. I don't care what people and people today claim that they're apostles. No, they're not apostles. I wish I had the time to tell you and share with you why they can't be apostles. But there's no more apostles. There was 12, and that's it. Well, of course, Judas, but he fell by transgression. Some believe that uh, there in the book of Acts that, that uh, what was that? What was his name? Matthias? Matthias. Huh? Matthias. Matthias. They say he's had more education than I have. Matthias was appointed uh, a, an apostle. Personally, I believe that Paul was the one that was appointed the apostle. It was just 12. There can only be 12. They have to be eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. And, and there's, there's several reasons. There's four or five, six reasons why there can only be 12 apostles, and I'm not going into that right now. But one thing I noticed about the church, there's no big shots in the church. Even those these men are apostles? Look who's presiding, James, the pastor. He's the one that's, that's conducting it. And look what happened every time. The church sanctions it. In this church, and let me share this with you. I never did, I never did, and it just, it makes chills to go up my back when somebody calls me Reverend Dobbs. Oh, that puts chills up my back. I don't know who ever started that. I'll tell you what, the word, the term, the name reverend is only ascribed to one person. Do you know who that is? God. 
Do you know who reverend is? Do you know what that word means, reverend? Awesome and terrible in power. And I'm not. I'm scared of my wife. <laughs> now, if you want to call somebody reverend, no, she's so sweet. What did the Lord say? Call nobody rabbi, father, but what? Rather, brother. <laughs> Do you know why the church doesn't need any big shots? Do you know why the church don't need a pope? Because God runs the church. Christ runs the church. We're just the brothers. And you'll find all through the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit said this, the Holy Spirit said that, and he spoke through the church. Do you remember when the apostles there in the first part of Acts when they were, uh, uh, there was problems in the early church because the Greeks weren't, felt like they weren't getting their share of the food and, and they thought the Jews were getting more of the food. And so they, the, the apostles said, we think it's good that, that, that we elect or, or appoint deacons to wait tables to see that the food is distributed fairly so that we can give ourselves to the study and the preaching of the Word. But did you notice how they did it? The 12 apostles stood up and said, I choose you and you and you and you and you and you. No, they didn't do that. What did they do? The church chose the deacons. Amen. Folks, the power is not in the preacher. The power is in the church. Now, let me share something with you while, while I'm in this, while I'm into this, and I didn't even intend to do this. Now, in a Baptist church, when we baptize, and this seems strange to a lot of people that aren't Baptist. I've never baptized anyone, by the way. I'm proud to say. If you were baptized right here under my ministry, you were baptized by the church. Had some visitors one time and they came and someone joined the church that morning. That morning. And I said, these people come as, you know, I don't remember how they came as uh, by statement or by letter or whatever. And I said, what's the pleasure of the church? Someone said, I make a motion, we accept them. I said, all in favor signify by uplifted hand, any opposed. And when it was over, the lady and her husband was leaving, and she was very irate. I never heard of anybody voting on anybody in a church. That's the silliest thing, blah, 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 blah. Well, folks, I want to tell you something. I do not have the authority. God didn't give me the authority to accept anybody into this church. And we don't vote people in the church. The church approves them. As they are led by the Holy Spirit, the church approves them. That's all we're doing. What is the, what is the, the, the consensus of the church as they're led by the Holy Spirit? That's why we do it. We're not voting somebody in. But what do you feel is the leading of the Holy Spirit concerning these people? That's exactly what we did this morning when Brother Tanton, Raymond, and his wife Pat came. What, what did I say there? What? Huh? Oh, I thought it was Raymond. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Rose, now what did they say? <laughs> but we want you to know what we were doing. The church, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, accepted you. When we baptize anyone, that's the reason I said upon the profession of your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and by the authority of Calvary Baptist Church, I baptize thee in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The church baptized you. Now, let me show you the wisdom in that. What if I never was really saved? Then you're not really baptized. But if the church baptizes you, you're baptized. Does that make sense? See, and the reason I'm bringing all this out is because, you know, in a lot of churches, someone will come forth, the preacher baptizes them. The church don't have anything to do with it. He just baptizes them. 
By whose authority? We find in the book of Acts that the authority, all authority, was given to the church. It wasn't even given to the apostles. It's through the authority of the church as the church is led by the Holy Spirit. Now, now let me show you this. And this is about, boy, we didn't get into the lesson tonight, did we? And I studied all of chapter 16. I thought, man, we're going to whiz right through this book. And I didn't even get down to where we left off last time. Look what happened. Look at verse, chapter 13 again. Boy, that's the way it ought to be, folks. This is the way it ought to be. Christ is the head of the church. Amen. You know, I'll tell you something else. You can go to the bookstores and you can get a dozen books on how to know the will of God for your life. And I believe the greatest problem I've had since I've been in the ministry, and Rex can probably say the same thing, is people come to him and say, I don't know what God's will is for my life. Is that right, Rex? That's right. Hey, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest with you. Now, I, I can tell you what the will of God is for your life in certain areas. You're, you're to be holy, that's God's will. You're to be faithful, that's God's will. You're to be witnesses, that's God's will. But I mean specifically, where should you be? Where should you be ministering? What should you do? Who should you speak to? Who should you not speak to? The apostles didn't even know that. Why? Because they were led of the Holy Spirit, and they didn't know from one day to the next where there's going to be or what they're going to do, and we're going to find that out. But now look how the church works. Uh, by that, look how Christ works through the church. Now there was at the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucas of Serene and Man Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now notice... As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Who did? The church. You see, even the apostle Paul and, and, and uh, Barnabas, they didn't just wake up some day and come to the church and say, Hey, the Holy Spirit has called us away. No. God spoke through the church. And that's the way it has always been. And if it's a proper kind of church, that's the way it will always be until Christ returns. Now, I'm thankful that God gave apostles to the church. But you know what? The apostles, none of them thought, themselves, thought of themselves as big shots. And I want to tell you something else. The apostles were not infallible, we're going to find out, except when they were writing Scripture or speaking Scripture. That's the only time they were infallible. That's the only time they could not make a mistake. Now, the rest of the prophets, do you remember the Scripture said, if a prophet prophesies, let others judge. There were men or women in the church that had the spirit of discernment. And when someone would get up and prophesy, then these that had the spirit of discernment would say, that is correct or that is a false prophecy. But they, and they were to judge the prophets. In other words, is what he says correct? And they had that spirit, they had that gift. Why? Because they didn't have the written word then. They didn't have the written word. So a prophet would stand up in the church and he would prophesy and then the men or the women that had that, that, that uh, gift of discernment would say, amen, or sit down. Now here's the problem. You see, when this goes on in the churches today and a lot of, a lot of churches have prophecy, you know one of two things. Either God is speaking through them or God isn't speaking through them. You don't know whether God's speaking through them. And, I, and that can be very dangerous. I have a, a cousin. Now, now, I hope God forgives me if, if I don't say this right. But this is the way it was related to me. His name is Dr. Broadus Hale. And he teaches in seminaries. Uh, not in this country, but Baptist seminaries. He teaches Greek and Hebrew and, and some of those languages. And, and he's back now to the States, and I'd love to have him come sometime and tell about 
his missionaries. Very godly man. But he was in a meeting. The way I understand it, he was in a meeting, and it was in one of those churches where they do speak in tongues. And he was in this meeting, and someone got up and spoke in tongues, and they were waiting for somebody to interpret. No, no, no. No, I've got it wrong. They, the people were speaking in tongues. Well, in a little bit, he stood up, and he quoted. Someone jumped up and gave the interpretation. When they sat down, he stood back up and said, I don't know what they said or where they got it, but he said, all I did was quote John 3.16 in Hebrew. It's dangerous. Folks, I want to tell you something. They had prophets because they didn't have the completion of the word of God. We have all we need right here. Amen. We have all we need. But what I was going to say is this. Even back then, and because they didn't have the word, the written word, when someone would stand up and prophesy, God gave gifted men and women the church that spirit of discernment so the Holy Spirit would tell them that's correct or that is not from God. But when the apostles spoke, you didn't judge them. When they spoke, that was scripture. That was the word of God. They were not judged on what they said. Other than that, they carried no more authority, nor did they claim any more authority. They were just another church member. And I want to share something else with you. God called me into the ministry way back in 1967. And God called Rex into the ministry, called Jason into the ministry. But I want to tell you something. That's Brother Rex. It's Brother Jason, and I'm Brother Dobbs. God didn't put me here as Lord over his heritage. He didn't put me here to run the church. God gave me a ministry, and that ministry is to preach and feed the sheep. God gave each of you ministries, and you are to do those ministries as you are led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Someday I will answer to the King of kings and the Lord of lords for the ministry that he's given me. Someday you also will answer for the ministry that he gave you. But I want to tell you something. We're all on even ground here. I'm no better than you are. You're no better than I am. We're all led by the Holy Spirit, and it's thus saith the Lord through the church. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm guilty by not taking any more authority than I do, but I, I'm afraid of taking authority. People will come to me and and, and I, I'm just another member. I preach the word to the church, but I'm another member. And as it's, it's, it's God leads the church, as God speaks to the church. I know we didn't get very far, and, and, but it, I'm learning a lot out of the book of Acts. And it's not necessarily what's written, but I, I'm just I, I'm getting how the church worked and how God worked through the church. And, and to find out that the apostles didn't consider them anything other than just church members with a special gift that God had given them a special calling and a job to do in their life, just as the pastors of those churches had a ministry and were to do it, and as each and every member had a ministry and they were to do it faithfully. But they didn't come in and run the church. And you find out when they went through and they would come and visit the church, they were guests. They were polite. They didn't just come in and say, boom, 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 boom. No, they didn't do that. Now, they did their job. And the only time they claimed authority is if the church got out of line scripturally. If they were out of line scripturally, if they were going back under the Mosaic law, or if they were into immorality, I mean the apostles would take the hide off, salt it down, and slip it right back on. But they didn't run the church. But they were there to correct and guide the church because God spoke through them as scripture was being written. Let's stand.